Let me read Matthew 21 to you. And really, today's scripture is all about uh, bad tenants. The main idea of my message is bad tenants get evicted because they forget who owns the building. Isn't that true? They forget who owns the building. And when it comes to our lives, guess what? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. And I think when we forget that, we, in a sense, become bad tenants. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to be that. So let me read to you this morning, Matthew chapter 21, verse 33 through 46. And this is the parable of the wicked tenants. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, now listen to another story. A certain landowner planted a vineyard, built a wall around it. He dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice and built a lookout tower. And then he leased the vineyard to the tenant farmers and moved to another country. And at the time of the great harvest, grape harvest, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. But the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. So the landowners sent a, a larger group of servants to collect for him. But the results were the same. Finally, the owner sent his son, thinking, surely they will respect my son. But when the tenant farmer saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to his, this estate. Come, let's kill him and get the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him. They dragged him out of the vineyard and they murdered him. And when the owner of the vineyard returns, Jesus asked, what do you think he will do to those farmers? The religious leaders replied, he will put the wicked men to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him the share of, of the crop after each harvest, his share. And then Jesus asked them, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone it falls on. When the leading priests and Pharisees heard this parable, they realized he was telling the story against them. They were the wicked farmers. They wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowds who considered Jesus to be a prophet. Well, there's God's word for today. Let's take a moment to pray that our minds will be uh, prepared. Lord, I lift everyone up to you and... Uh, Every Sunday I come here expecting for your work to be done, Lord, that you're here, you're present in your spirit, in our hearts. But Lord, sometimes we get distracted. Sometimes we're focused on worldly things, other things. So in this moment, Lord, every single individual, I pray that their attention is on you and your word, and more than anything, on the Savior, Lord. So we thank you this morning. Pray that you help me to preach well. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, all right, such a, a wonderful thing to be able to share with you the scriptures this morning. And this is some pretty, this is a heavy parable, right? Jesus has just shared with the leading priests and the elders that story about a father that had two sons, right? One son that said no to him when the father said to go and work but then decided, no, I, you know, I'm going to follow my father's instructions. And that second son who says yes to God, yes, yes, I'll do what you ask, and then he doesn't. And he's sharing this with these high priests and elders because they're the ones who have rejected and turned from God. They said yes, but now that the Savior was there, they were saying no. And because of that, those who initially said no, but then changed their mind, they were the ones who were going to get the kingdom of heaven. And these were the ones that, you know, they made feel excluded from the kingdom of God, right? The, the ones who were steeped in sin, the ones who were struggling with greed and lust and, and all sorts of, of difficulties, they knew there was a chance to be cleansed. 
that what God was going to provide was a way in, a way for them. And they said yes to God. But unfortunately, you know, the religious, the proud were clouded. They couldn't see. So here Jesus is going to share a second story with them. And this story is quite detailed if you hadn't picked up on it. This is a story about Jesus himself. The fact that the owner of the farm wasn't just going to keep sending messengers. He was going to send his very son with the expectation that they would wake up. That they would recognize who he was and would stop cheating God from what was his. My title of my sermon today is what a moocher, right? You ever use that word? What a moocher. You can look it up. Pretty much the definition of a moocher is someone who takes and with no chance of getting anything in return, right? Someone who takes without ever paying back. That's what a moocher is. And you know, as I think about all that God has done for me, I don't want to be a moocher. I don't want to take things from God and uh, bring no return. And I know this story is focused solely on the high priests and elders, but I refuse to tell you to just sit back. This isn't about you. (laughs) Because guess what? Whatever sin, you know, Israel had fallen into, whatever sin these elders and priests fall into, we can fall into just as quickly. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, everything that you have is from him. And if you're not serving him, if you don't honor Christ, if you're not living for him, you're mooching. You're enjoying life, but you're not giving God his due. So here we see in verse 33, Jesus sharing that story. And I think it sets up the reality of it. A certain landowner planted a vineyard. A certain landowner, right? Here we're speaking of God himself. He set up the world. He designed it. And he decorated it. And he put everything necessary. And and more specifically, I think it's targeting the nation of Israel, right? Who would they have been? They would have been dead in some bush somewhere because that people was this big. They were going nowhere in the world. But God chose Abraham out of the world. And he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. From you, I'm going to produce some fruit. There's going to be some excellent things that come that the whole world is going to be blessed. So here, the sense that this landowner's planted a vineyard, he's built a wall around it, He dug a pit for pressing out the grape juice, and he built a lookout tower. So this thing's all decked out, right? A piece of land. It's not just a piece of land. It is set up and ready to go. You've got everything you need. As I was reading that, I couldn't help but think it. I actually got to go to to Nazareth. When you guys sent me to Israel, I got to go to Nazareth. And in Nazareth, they found unearthed a, uh, a press where um, grapes would be pressed, hewn into the stone. So I got to go into this little kind of park and, and stand on this stone that might have been one that Jesus stood by and used himself. The landowner has provided everything that a farmer could want. Really, the only thing left is the labor. And it says in verse 1 that he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers and he moved to another country. That's kind of an interesting statement. But the first uh, blank on your scribe sheet, I want to get to that before I, I mention what I think about that second line. But the first thing that we need to understand, because this applies to you as much as it did the high priest, everything you have has been given to you. Do you believe that? I think that's when we get in trouble. When we stop recognizing that everything you have is because he gave it to you. The life that you have right now, the job that you have, the family that you have, the health that you have. And I know you may say, well, I don't have everything. I wish I had more. But anything that you have, it's because he gave it to you. He gave you life. And he's equipped you to live that life. Don't forget that. I think when we forget that, don't we take it for granted? We begin living for ourselves God becomes an afterthought. Well, I'll see him on Sunday. But as far as my attitude throughout the week, do I think, wow, my job, my life, my everything is from God? Man, would our lives change if we thought that every day? Everything we have has been given to us. And here, I think in the story that Jesus is sharing with the high priests and the elders, he's saying, you know, everything that Israel has 
Everything that you have is from God. They're going to get it at the end. This is about them. So just right up front, I'll tell you, Jesus is sharing this story because they've forgotten that. Everything they had was because of him. The temple, the priesthood, the nation. God had decked them out, gave them everything, and he had an expectation That end of verse 33, it says, Then he leased the vineyard to tenant farmers, and he moved to another country. So he sets it all up, he finds a people, he gives it to the people, and then he leaves. And I guess you could be thinking, well, isn't it? Some people have that thought of God, that God just kind of got the, the world spinning and he's off somewhere not paying attention. But that is not the God of the Bible. God is paying attention. God has his hands in everything. He has his hands in your life. But in a sense, God gave Israel everything that they had. He leased it to them. And he had basically stepped back because, you know what, once God gives you everything you need, he doesn't control you, does he? You're left to do with what you have, what you decide. The question is, what are you doing with what God has given you? What are you doing? Because it matters. Verse 34 says, "At uh, at the time of the grape harvest... He sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. Wow, big surprise here. Someone sets up this beautiful farm, leases it to some tenants, and then come harvest time, he wants a share. God wants a share. And most people, most reasonable people would say, of course he does. He gave you everything with an expectation that there would be something left, you know, some part of it for him. And I think as we think about our lives, what you have, which is everything, do you think he's now withdrawn and has no expectation from you at all? That second point in your scribe sheet is is your use of those things is not for free. Those use, the use of those things is not for free. What things? Everything. And what's not for free? You. You are not given life so that you could go about your business doing whatever makes you happy and whatever you want. God is looking for return on his investment. And God was looking for return on his investment in Israel. They were to recognize him and elevate him and point the people to him. This is the Savior. But they refused because, you know, they forgot who owned the building. Bad tenants get evicted because they forget who owns the building. Could that happen to one of us? If I got to a point where I forgot that everything I had was from him, could he take that away? Had he done that in history? I venture to say he has. I don't want to be ungrateful for what God has given me. I hope you don't. Because I'll tell you, when you forget who owns the building, you begin to live for yourself. You take all the profits. You benefit completely from the breath that you breathe. Jesus shares with them that, no, no, God is expecting a harvest. And I, if we can go back to the Old Testament and the whole sacrificial system and the, the way of, you know, the, and I guess I could have spent a, a lot of time on that. But, you know, whenever there was a harvest, did God just expect the people to keep what was theirs? There was always that reminder, bring to me your first fruits. Bring to me the beginning of your harvest. And don't bring the bad stuff, Right? It needs to be the best stuff. Bring to me the first and the best that you have. Because guess what? You would have none of it if it wasn't for me. Isn't that a message for us today? Do you give God the best of your life? The most unblemished parts of who you are? Because he's given you everything. What a message. As much as I'd like to sit back and go, yeah, yeah. You tell those Pharisees, you tell those elders. There's got to be some conviction on our part. This is a message speaking of the nation of Israel and how God was working in history, even in that moment. And look what he says in verse 35. In verse 35, he says, 
But the farmers grabbed his servants. Oh, excuse me. So, yeah, he sent his servants to collect his share of the crop. And as you can imagine, who were God's servants, right? We, we can think of angels. We can think of prophets. We can think of anyone that had a word from God throughout the history of Israel. They kept trying to bring the people to that conclusion. God is expecting of us. He is looking for something from us. And what that is is the best of what we have, the first of what we have. God sent prophets, but it says in verse 35, the, f- the farmers grabbed his servants, beat one, killed the other, and stoned another. So the landowner sent a larger group of his servants to collect for him, but the results were the same. So here, God is sending messengers. He's sending people to the nation of Israel to say, hey, you're losing your way. You're missing it. You forgot where all this stuff came from. God is expecting you to be faithful. They were worshiping false idols. They were doing deplorable things with the things that God had given him. And we do the same today. When we don't live for the Lord, when we give in to the lusts and the passions of our flesh, I think we've gone down that same road. We're idol worshiping. We're idol worshiping gods who've given us nothing and we're ignoring the one who's given us everything. And the warning is bad tenants get evicted because they forget who owns the building. God owns you. He owns me. And the question is, you know, am I recognizing that each day? Does God send messengers to you? And hey, isn't this a message, right? I'm sending you a message. Don't forget who owns the building. God owns everything that you have. And that charge, invert the third point in your scribe sheet, don't be a moocher. Don't be a moocher. No one likes a moocher. But I think when we don't live for him, when we don't seek to get him noticed, to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord around our friends and our family, we ignore what should be his, what's first, what's best. And that's ultimately what Jesus is trying to show them. He sent them servants. He sent them prophets. And one by one, they eliminated every messenger. So what did God do? God sent even more messengers, larger groups, right? We have all the prophets. You look at the prophets in the nation of Israel. They were plenty. And what did they do with them? Thank you for reminding us. That's not what they did. They killed them. They eliminated the reminder. And that's kind of what we do, right? When we're enjoying everything that we have and we forget God, we're going to eliminate anything that might bring us to the fact that that's not your stuff. So what does Jesus do here in this moment? Jesus is another prophet for them to receive. He's more than that prophet. And I love, this is, you know, anyone who denies the fact that Jesus is you know, divine, this is a great parable to share with them because here Jesus draws a distinction between the prophets and himself. Jesus is not just a prophet. Who is he? What can we see in the scriptures? Because ultimately Jesus doesn't really come out and say, hey guys, I'm God. He doesn't do it like that, right? But he does it. He does it in a way that those who want to see will see. And here, I think this is a way that he's revealing himself. The fact that here I am, I'm divine. I'm the son of the father. So verse 37, Jesus says, finally, the owner sent his son, thinking surely they will respect my son. But then it says, but when the tenant farmers saw his son coming, they said to one another, here comes the heir to to this estate. Come on, let's kill him and get the, est- the estate for ourselves. So they grabbed him, they dragged him out of the vineyard, and they murdered him. Here, Jesus is bringing a message to the high priests and elders that, you know what, what you've been doing for centuries, you're about to do again, but it's not just the prophet that you're going to kill. It's going to be the Son of God. Here, Jesus defines himself as being, you know, that, that son of God that 
one who is equal with the Father, that blasphemous statement, if it wasn't true, right? So as, a, as we think about all that God has done to, to wake us up, the fourth point on your scribe sheet is don't abuse the, God's messengers. Don't abuse God's messengers. Listen to them. Listen to God's word. Listen to the, the advice maybe you get from other Christians. Listen. Don't forsake giving God what he's expecting of us. And, you know, as I was thinking, as my guitar string broke, you know, I already received this message last during our praise time, and I, I think Leah would laugh kind of at it. My string broke already before that, and when the string breaks, I decided, all right, that's the indication that I need to change all the strings. But did I do that? I ignored my message, and I played it cheap. I put another string that, I put the string back on that broke. And I didn't change all of the strings because I'm cheap. All right, I'll admit it right now. I'm cheap. I was sent a message by my guitar that you better, you know, bad things are about to come. You're about to ignore, you know, something. And I'm going to put you in a position where you're going to be left, you know, to your own devices. And I think that happens, right? God sends us little messages of, hey, you're wandering away from me. Hey, you're missing, you know, the fact that I'm looking for a return on the investment that I've made in you. And if we don't listen, he speaks louder. You know, a string breaking during praise time, that's a new experience. Isn't it great to have new experiences? <laughs> I know I didn't die. I... I you know, I did the best I could, and that's sometimes how we're made stronger. But uh, in the end, maybe we don't have to do things the hard way. What do you think? To not do things the hard way would be wise, I suspect. And as we think about it, bad tenants get evicted because they forget who owns the building. Let's not forget who owns the building. Because maybe he's going to evict you in a sense that he's going to distance himself to you and you're going to feel that absence, right? Even David praying for God to give his spirit back to him. I think that happens for us. As we wander away from him, he takes a little step back and we feel his absence and we mourn the loss. God is seeking from us to remember why we have life to begin with. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 28. I did want to just share with you uh, just a, you know, this is where we see a reference to the scripture that we're going to come to pretty soon. Isaiah 28, and really I think here the same sort of thing is happening in the history of Israel, but it's also prophetic, and a lot of that prophecy has a meaning in the time that it's written, but also speaks to the future, right? The the things to then were symbols, in a way, to the, the realities that would be seen in Christ. Isaiah 28 speaks to a people who were putting confidence uh, where they, you know, they took for granted where they had everything. Isaiah 28, 14. If, let's look at verse 14. I'd like to read it. And then you'll kind of get it as we get to the end of our Matthew verse. But it says, Therefore, listen to this message from the Lord, you scoffing rulers in Jerusalem. You boast, we have struck a bargain to cheat death and have made a deal to dodge the grave. The coming destruction can never touch us, for we have built a strong refuge uh, made of lies and deception. All right here they are, the, the leaders, uh, the rulers in Jerusalem, and they think they've got it made. Nothing's going to touch us. We can do whatever we want, and we're all going to turn out okay. But then God points to them. He says, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Look, I am placing a foundation stone in Jerusalem, a firm and tested stone. And it is a precious cornerstone that is safe to build on. Whoever b believes need never be shaken. And, uh, you know, if you just go on reading, it just speaks to the fact that these people had lost themselves in the provision of God. Maybe you're doing that today. Maybe you've lost yourself in God's provision. You've taken for granted the fact that everything good that we have has come from him. It's time to wake up. It's time to stop putting uh, confidence in the fact that you're guaranteed tomorrow. You're not. Back to uh, Matthew chapter 21. I 
I think uh, one of the points worth making is on the scribe sheet there, and uh, you know it speaks to to these bad tenant farmers, right? They weren't ready for the sun to show up. Their hearts had not changed. Their hearts had not been broken in their own sinfulness. So when the Savior came, they killed him. And this is a testimony to the fact that they were going to kill Jesus Christ. They were going to crucify him because they wanted all that God had and they thought they could steal it from him. The fifth point on your scribe sheet is you're not ready for Christ if you're rejecting everything else that he's given you. You're not ready for Christ if you've rejected everything else he has given you, right? If you don't acknowledge that your life is uh, because of him, right? Christ is just going to be a barrier to what else you want. You become spoiled in a sense and you just want to take, take, take. And if you don't acknowledge your life is being given from God, Christ is just going to be a stumbling block to you. And all I can say is, wake up. Remember where all that you have has come from. And thank him for it. Thank him for your life. Maybe you've had a tough life, but I suspect in the, in the, uh, the midst of all that, you've had some joy. You've had some, uh, some good things. Thank him for that. And look for more, because he has more. That more is given to us in Jesus Christ. But you're not ready if you're rejecting everything else he's given you. And that's the, uh, the problem, I think, with the, uh, the lead priests and the, the elders. They weren't ready. Their hearts had not been broken. They didn't listen to John the Baptist. They were resistant to God because everything they had in their minds was from themselves. Let me read to you uh, Acts chapter 4. Here in Acts chapter 4, uh, Peter and John are speaking to the people, and uh, they were confronted by the priests, the captain, uh, the captain of the temple guard and some of the Sadducees, and it says these leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is resurrection of the dead. And they arrested them, and it goes on, and uh, Peter ends up being filled with the Spirit in verse 8. And he says to these uh, people, he says, rulers and elders of our people, we are being questioned. Are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Right? They had healed someone. And it says, do you know, uh, do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ. The Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. And again, we see that same verse. It says, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures, where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Jesus Christ is is the greatest gift that God has given humanity. And he's available to those who understand where everything else they have has come from. Going back to Matthew 21, Matthew 21, verse uh, 40, Jesus continues the conversation with these stubborn, right, and unbroken Pharisees and elders and, right, high priests, and he asked them a hypothetical question. Given the story that I just told you, right, these unthankful tenant farmers who are renting a place and the owner comes to get his share and not only do you kill his messengers, you kill his son. And Jesus asked them, you know, he says, when the owner of the vineyard returns, what do you think he's going to do to those farmers? It's a good question, isn't it? The religious leaders ignorant in that moment, right, answer the question exactly as to how they think the tenant should be treated. He says, he will put the wicked men to a horrible death and lease the vineyard to others who will give him his share of the crop after each harvest. I wonder if they stumbled as they got to the end of that statement, realizing, oh my goodness, I just condemned myself. I just told Jesus that that bad tenant farmer should be horribly 
punished, should be killed, and that vineyard should be given to others. And just as it comes off their lips, you can see that the wheels turn and, oh, wait a minute. You're talking about us. We're those bad tenant farmers, right? You see it. They answer the question gleefully. And then it says, uh, Jesus answers. He says, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. Anyone who stumbles over that stone will be broken to pieces and it will crush anyone it falls on. Jesus asked them in verse 42, he says, didn't you ever read this in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has now become the capstone and this is the Lord's doing and it is wonderful to see. That stone that would cause some to stumble had come and they were stumbling all over him and they needed to wake up. And ultimately, Jesus says, because you guys have misused all that God has given you, you not only killed his messengers, you're about to kill his son. That kingdom of God is now going to be given to someone else. You were part of that kingdom in a sense, right? Israel had a way in which they could relate to God through the temple and the law of Moses, and that was the system. But that system was going to be moved to one of faith in Christ And they were going to miss out on that. That kingdom of God, that reign of God was no longer going to be through the law of Moses. It was going to be through trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And they weren't going to get it. Someone else was going to get it. And look at what it says, verse 43. The kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation that will produce the proper fruit. There we see it again. God wants a return on his investment. He saves you to do good works, to have righteous character, to draw attention to him, that he would finally get what is due him. And what is it that he wants? He wants to be loved with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. He wants that. And I think he deserves that, doesn't he? The final point on your scribe sheet is that You know, give God his due. Today, you, give God his due. Don't miss the fact that everything you have is his. Make Christ Lord and live to get him noticed. As I think about, you know, the fruit that God's looking for, I think when you give uh, the owner his share, you're pointing everyone back to the fact that, you know, everything we have is because of him. Everything we have right now is because of Christ. If it wasn't for Christ, we would be hopeless. So what are you doing with what God has given you? Are you getting Christ noticed? And let's pray that you do. And I think we'll end there today as we uh, have communion. Let me close in a word of prayer. Lord, it's always a challenge, I think, when, uh, when you give a child too much, he tends to uh, forget that he needs to be grateful. You end up spoiling the child. And I think, Lord, let's face it, you've spoiled us. You've given us so much. Uh, even speaking more specifically, even to those in this room, you've given us a, a country to live in where we're free. We're not being murdered because we're Christians. You've given us great... Uh, ability to, to provide for ourselves. We live in a land where we have so much compared to the rest of the world. But that isn't by chance, Lord. You've given us these things. You've placed us in this place because you want return. And the first step to bringing to you what you deserve is to acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. So, Lord, I pray anyone here maybe who is Uh, on the fence, not thinking about what it is specifically you want. Number one is you want our heart, Lord. And that needs to come by our acknowledgement that we need you, that because of our sin, as Pastor Greg was sharing, that we, we just are not worthy of being in your presence, but you provided a way to be cleansed. And that is through the blood of Christ, Lord. I pray for anyone here who needs to make that decision, that they've made it, 
And if not, Lord, that they get on their knees and and confess to you today that they are a sinner in need of salvation and they found it in Jesus Christ. Lord, don't let us take for granted all that you've done for us. Help us to be righteous in our character because we care, to be more Christ-like, to serve and bless those around us. And Lord, when given the opportunity, we give full credit to, to what we have, and that is to Jesus Christ. So Lord, I thank you this day that we have a, another reminder, another message. And I pray that we don't uh, take that for granted, that we don't stuff it down or uh, block it out, Lord, but that we let it come full, full boat into our heart, Lord, and we're changed by it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.